Video Why is the West to blame in Ukraine featuring John Mearsheimer has been present on YouTube for a long time and has over 25 million views. At first glance the video looks good, thumbnail consists of a professor in the suit and the channel that uploaded the lecture is the University of Chicago. However, the lecture is a complete disaster. Salvos of erroneous premises and unintelligent conclusions were presented. In this video I intend to debunk the lecture of John Mearsheimer. I will not play the video of lecture because I don't want my video to be too long, but I will refute his thesis. Of course you can always check out his lecture to make sure that I didn't misrepresent him anywhere. So let's get started. In the first part of the lecture, Mearsheimer emphasized the division of Ukraine on linguistic and political level. First of all, it is necessary to redefine the term pro-Russian. In the previous video, I already mentioned that Russophony does not equal Russian, mentioning the example of Irish people who speak English but are not English. For example, Yulia Timoshenko and Vladimir Zelensky were originally Russophones. As you can see, they are clearly not Russians, nor are they pro-Russian. When it comes to pro-Russian political options, the narrative on the basis of which they were winning votes was that of neutrality, cooperation with both the West and Russia, obtaining a discount on Russian gas and so on. They have never advocated territorial disintegration of Ukraine. The annexation of Crimea and the proxy war in Donbas changed everything. For instance, the allegedly pro-Russian east of Ukraine, such as Sumy, Kharkiv, Mariupol, Zaporozhye and Kramatorsk, offer the fiercest resistance to the Russian aggression. The author underestimates the complexity of Ukrainian society. Every society consists of various individuals. The psychology of each individual is very complex. It is impossible to cram the entire Ukrainian population into two boxes that will be lightly characterized as pro-Russian or pro-Western. This is especially true for such upheavals as the 2014 war. As I come from a country that has experienced a bloody war relatively recently, I know how such events can radically change the way people think. His approach is reminiscent of old colonial politicians and historiographers whose views on nations were basically a pile of stereotypes and exaggerated generalizations. Thus, for example, in the beginning of the 20th century, it was widely believed in the West that ethnic groups were also racial categories and that each of these races had psychological, even moral and not only physical characteristics. According to that theory, the morality, mentality and the worldview of individual peoples are racially determined. That way they fail to acknowledge their complexity. Now let's get back to the topic. It seems reasonable to conclude that there was a huge discrepancy between the political view of a Ukrainian person before 2014. Person who lived in eastern Ukraine, knew many Russians, had never experienced or seen war and the perspective of that same person after Russia had launched a proxy war and annexation of parts of his country, especially after 2022 when it turned into a complete mass invasion. In other words, Russia gained Crimea and half of Donbass in 2014, but lost the hearts and minds of the rest of Ukraine. Before that, under Yanukovych, all of Ukraine had been a Russian puppet state. Mearsheimer argues that the West is to blame for the conflict in Ukraine because it wants to peel away Ukraine from Russian orbit and incorporate it into the West and turn it into its bulwark. He cites several NATO expansions on several occasions, but that Russia did nothing about it because it was too weak and because those countries are not on Russia's border, except for the Baltic countries which the author finds small and claims that it was early in the game. He also states that NATO welcomed the Euro-Atlantic aspirations of Georgia and Ukraine. It sounds somewhat hypocritical that the author considers it completely natural and normal that Russia wants to have its own orbit and its own bulwark and resents the same behavior to the West, since he finds the West to be the only culprit. Later, he made it clear that by the West he means only the US. 
Furthermore, the three Baltic states have joined NATO only in 2004, four years after Putin had come to power, much later than, for example, Hungary, which had been in NATO since 1999. In addition, the fact that these countries are small does not mean that they are not strategically extremely important. Just look at how close Estonia is to St. Petersburg and how it encircles Russia in the Gulf of Finland. On top of that, Mearsheimer continues with the colonial narrative. Namely, he insinuates that Ukrainians do not have any right or even the ability to decide on the fate of their country on their own. According to the author's perspective, Ukrainians are not a subject but a geopolitical object. They would simply have to reconcile the fact that they are part of the Russian orbit. It is worth noting that the Ukrainian aspirations of incorporation into the West seems quite reasonable. Namely, countries such as Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia and Poland have made tremendous progress since Euro-Atlantic integration. On the other hand, countries that remained in Russian orbit, such as quasi-neutral Ukraine, Belarus and Armenia, fell far behind. In addition, there is a huge difference between the way NATO and the EU expands and maintains its orbit, and how Russia does the same with its own orbit. Countries that want to join the EU stand in line and submit applications, gradually receive assistance and try to meet the criteria. On the other hand, who are Putin's allies? We can list the following countries, members of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, Russia's counterpart to the NATO Pact, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Armenia has a very poor geographical situation. They are a landlocked country located between hostile Turkey and Azerbaijan. In such conditions, they had no choice but to be in Russian orbit. After emergence of certain pro-Western trends, a new war in Nagorno-Karabakh had occurred. Russia allowed the Azeris to achieve military victory with Turkish assistance and launched a peace agreement that led to an extremely poor situation for Armenians and Armenia. Most of Karabakh was given to Azerbaijan, but the most densely populated part of Karabakh, where most Armenians live, has remained under Russian protection in such a way that Armenian territory is completely indefensible. Namely, they are completely separated from Armenia and surrounded by Azeris, except for one narrow corridor controlled by the Russian army. It can be said that Russia is holding Armenians by their neck. That neck is the corridor. Belarus is a dictatorship ruled by President Lukashenko, who is famous for unintelligent statements. One of the funniest examples of his statements is one unintentionally hilarious interview when he said that Putin had promised him the rank of colonel in the Russian army. The interviewee laughed and asked how is it possible for the president of one state to become a colonel in the army of another state. Lukashenko seriously answered, that is my problem, not yours. So, to sum it up, Belarus is a Russian puppet state infamous for its political repression. Kazakhstan and Tajikistan are also dictatorships where a cult of personality persists. Much more could be said about these countries, but that's the topic for another video. Let's go back to Ukraine. What is the alternative to Euro-Atlantic integration? Neutrality does not seem to be an option. Namely, in the time of pro-Russian President Yanukovych, known for corruption and luxury house, the Russian army was allowed to remain in Crimea until 2042, despite Yanukovych himself saying that Ukraine should be militarily neutral. What kind of neutrality is it if the Russian army is in Crimea? So, it seems that the alternative to the West is the Belarusian scenario. As I emphasized in the last video, Russia is a relatively poor country. Russian society is also characterized by huge social inequality. How could Ukraine benefit if it is in Russian orbit and Belarus 2.0? So, unlike NATO or EU, which attracts its allies to join voluntarily, Russia keeps its allies together by blackmail and racketeering. What Russia is offering Ukraine if it stays in Russia's orbit 
is that it will not attack it. This reminds of the Mafia model where you have to pay the mobster to protect you from himself. I wonder why Ukraine wants to join the West. It must be because they are led by Nazis, as Kremlin claims. This simply does not matter to Mearsheimer. He basically ignores everything. Mearsheimer spoke negatively about the Western promotion of democracy. I personally don't like false promotion of democracy. For example, the US condemns the dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad, but not the absolutist medieval monarchy of Saudi Arabia, whose internal organization is quite similar to that of the Islamic State. Mearsheimer does not condemn this fake promotion of democracy, but the very idea of promoting democracy as such. The question is, what is the alternative? Openly reject any moral system in politics and be guided solely by economic interests. In addition, Mearsheimer concluded that the American expansion of democracy means the overthrow of regimes around the world because they believe that all democratically elected statesmen will be pro-American. This is a lie, in my opinion. The West does not overthrow regimes because it believes that democratic regimes will be pro-Western, but because of geopolitical interests. For instance, the US supported so-called opposition in Syria, even though it was almost entirely jihadist. In addition, it is factually incorrect to claim that US is going around the world and overthrowing undemocratic regimes. The United States has overthrown some undemocratic regimes, like the one in Iraq, but it is on the other hand an ally with many undemocratic regimes. For example, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar and United Arab Emirates. So the overthrow of certain regimes has little to do with democracy, but with geopolitical interests. Democracy is a mere excuse. Accordingly, the West was very conciliatory towards Russia. Contrary to the author's claims that the West desperately wanted Ukraine in Euro-Atlantic integration. At the request of Germany and France, Russia was returned to the Council of Europe in 2019. Thus, they practically forgave them for occupying and annexing Crimea. And hence to not only breaking international law, but also their own promise. Specifically, Ukraine has pledged to give up nuclear weapons under pressure from the West which wanted as few countries as possible to have nuclear weapons for fearing of falling into the wrong hands. In return, Ukraine was given a guarantee for its territorial sovereignty. So Russia has deceived Ukraine and broke its own promise. Nonetheless, the West responded only with mild sanctions. Moreover, numerous Western corporations have invested heavily in Russia and some pro-Putin Russian oligarchs such as Abramovich have had a huge impact on European economy. The West has tolerated this for decades. Mearsheimer ignores all this because it does not fit in the thesis of the West as the only culprit for the conflict in Ukraine. The author states at 23rd minutes that it would be fair that the United States, according to the Monroe's doctrine, has the entire Western Hemisphere as its backyard. For that reason, Eastern Europe should be considered as the Russian backyard. Here you can see that I was right when I said that this man has a colonial way of thinking. But it is interesting that here he fails to recognize the EU as a political subject. Why couldn't Ukraine be Europe's backyard? Namely, if the United States, which has about 320 million inhabitants, or Russia with about 140 million inhabitants can have its own backyard, why can't the European Union have one? European Union has about 450 million inhabitants. When it comes to economic relations, Italy itself has a higher GDP than Russia. If his criterion is the military power, it still does not fit the argument. Russian armed forces with a budget equal to that of Saudi Arabia have been exposed, at least partially, to be a paper tiger in Ukraine, plagued by incompetence and bad organization. The Russian Federation simply cannot play the same role that USSR played, because it is simply incomparably weaker at all levels. It is tragicomic that Mearsheimer mocked American politicians for being people of the 21st century, who don't know about the balance of power. In fact, he is right that American politicians are the people of the 21st century, and he is a man of the 20th century.
even though he calls himself a man of 19th century. This does not mean that today's American politicians do not know about the balance of power, but that they are acting accordingly to the conditions of the 21st century. Unlike Mearsheimer, who is stuck in Cold War when USSR still existed as a superpower. What also must be added is that the balance of power from the Cold War did not mean peace. Namely, during the Cold War, exhausting and bloody wars were fought throughout Asia, Africa, the Middle East and Latin America. Interestingly, he claims that Putin is very rational and strategic. On the one hand, Mearsheimer portrays all Western politicians as complete idiots without any awareness of political reality. And on the other hand, he portrays Putin as a brilliant statesman. Time will tell if he was right. Very soon. In the coming years we will see how much the Russian invasion of Ukraine paid off to the Kremlin. This could be an example of small-minded American political rhetoric in which the main goal is to spit on the opponent political party, in this case the Obama administration. I have no will or desire to defend Obama at all. I can only assume what could be the motivation of this pseudo-expert in geopolitics. Mearsheimer concludes that the West did not anticipate Putin's reaction. I will return again to the statement made earlier. Russia gained Crimea and half of Donbass in 2014, but lost the rest of Ukraine. It was not a defeat of Western politics at all, nor did they care so much since they continued to trade and cooperate with Russia. Mearsheimer points out that by expanding NATO, the West is forcing the Russians towards the Iranians, whom they are selling weapons. This is an odd claim to make. As a man of the Cold War mentality, he should have known that the USSR financed anti-American states and guerrilla armies around the world. Thus, they were not deterred by the fact that the West did not expand beyond the block borders in Europe. In other words, who guarantees Western statesmen that the Russians will not support Iran even if they leave Ukraine to them as their puppet state. On contrary, new sanctions and pressure on Russia reduces the possibility of Russian support for Iran as well as any other country in the world. Today we can see Russian influence declining everywhere. It is ironic how he mentioned Iran because Iranian officials offered themselves as an alternative to Russian gas and oil. So the effect is exactly the opposite of what this cheap propagandist predicted. This is a good example of why, if you want to find out how capable, smart or honest analysis someone is, it is important to look at what that person said 5 or 10 years ago, rather than to look at what he is saying today. He was simply debunked by the course of history. However, his lecture was horribly bad even for 2015. At the end, I want to say that I acknowledge the concept of balance of power. I am not trying to debunk it. I only want to say that Mearsheimer simply overestimated the importance and power of Russia in that balance. And by the way, the whole lecture seems intellectually pretty low, as if it was made for children. Now let's summarize everything that was wrong in his lecture. He underestimated the importance of 2014 as a turning point. He exaggerated Russia's success in 2014. He misrepresented the West's policy towards Russia, ignoring the cooperation and the fact of forgiveness for the occupation of Crimea and Donbass. He underestimated the importance of the Baltic states. He completely ignored the right of Ukrainians to decide. He ignored the differences of Western and the Russian orbit. He did not problematize the issue of neutrality. He openly lied about US foreign policy. He ignored the European Union as a political factor. He mocked Western statesmen and praised Putin. He stated the wrong thesis about Iran and he completely overestimated the power and importance of Russia. If you like this video, please make sure to like, share and subscribe to my channel.